So some common components, if you want to measure this interaction between light and matter. Kind of a little flow chart here. It looks like, Brandy, you have to have a what? You have to have a light source. And this light source, Alyssa, is pretty much in what region of the electromagnetic spectrum? What would you label it? Anyone help her out? Roy G. Biv. Or visible. Visible probably sounds a little more technical than Roy G. Biv, but Roy G. Biv really is what we're looking at. So it's a light bulb. And I'm sure there's also infrared coming off of that too, but I can't draw infrared and you can't see it anyway. Okay. So you have your light source emitting all the wavelengths. And then it enters something. What does it look like what's coming out of it? Mel, what is it? What am I trying to illustrate here? I'm just trying to see green. So I have something here that's probably a blank selector, color selector. Or, but remember, we're talking about general spectroscopy, so it's not just going to be colors. So a better word than color might be wavelength selector. That's probably the best word that you can use. wavelength selector. Okay. So you want to see green. Okay. And then it's going to another box. And then look what's happening on the other side. The little arrows have changed. Randy, what do you think it's trying, I'm trying to illustrate here now? All right. They were these nice, bold, thick green lines. Now they're skinny and the light got, what would you say, Andy? The light got, certain A would be the best way to describe it. Absorbed, or since we're, absorption is really a couple measurements. So it's a better to say attenuated, right? That the intensity decreased. Something decreased the intensity. So you just say attenuated. If you say absorbed, at, you really technically, you got to, measure incident, and then you got to measure, there's multiple, then you got to do some calculations. So if you're just straightforward talking about att intensity decreasing, just say attenuated. So the light got attenuated and going from one side to the other side of this box. What's probably in that box? And remember, this is common to all s spectrometers. What's in that box? Probably the, the what? But what's spectrum? The analyte, right? Whatever is the matter, right? Because it's supposed to monitor the measure between light and matter interactions. So yeah, that's your matter. That's your analyte. Analyte's a great word to use. That's your analyte. Okay. Because you wouldn't have picked green if your analyte doesn't absorb green, right? So it makes sense that that's why you picked green in the first place. Okay. And then it ends up hitting this final box, and then nothing else happens. So that final box must be what, anybody? Andrew, that final box must be what? The detector. The detector, exactly. OK. So we're going to break down in each component here. And do you remember, we talked about it earlier, it's going to introduce it again. We should have it. Well, we'll come back to it. Let's just move on. Okay, well, let's talk about light sources and just follow the format here. What is the difference between a continuous and a discontinuous light source? Hmm. Andy, this looks like a what type of light source that I have in the diagram? Continuous. Continuous. And why do you, and he's right. Why? Because it's constant. There's no, there's no breaks, right? It's not like I just see red and yellow, or you know, there's no, 
it's just a smear of colors. Okay. Examples of some continuous and discontinuous light sources. Uh, Randy, here's one. A laser. What type would that be? She doesn't. You want to guess? You got a 50-50 shot. Continuous. Laser. Yeah. Laser is going to be discontinuous. It's it's a line. It's really narrow. There's nothing in between, right? It's it's kind of like if you made a plot of wavelength, right, and then intensity or something, and the colors, this one would have been a ah, big blob, big smear, right? But a laser, especially this little red laser pointer, I mean, there might be some little baseline, some little peak, you know, some little baseline peak, but it's going to be really narrow, a very narrow band of wavelengths. So they call that discontinuous. Discharge lamp. I can't find it. I think it got stolen. It was so, such a cool thing. Yeah, what's a discharge lamp? I can't. If it, pictures worth a thousand words. Yeah, I can show you the animation, but it's nothing as cool as looking at it. So now you got to imagine. Okay, you're going to have this glass tube. And so they sucked all the air out of it. And then in this glass tube, they melded metal onto each end. Okay, so right now you've got an evacuated glass tube with metal on each end. And then you've got, they're going to input a little bit of gas. Pick one. Neon gas, hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, whatever's a gas at room temp they'll throw in there, but really low pressure. Okay, then what they're going to do is they're going to apply a very high voltage across these two hunks of metal. So what ends up happening is, is electrons get ejected from one end, kind of like a filament end, and then they're going to, they want to get to the positive end, going across this glass tube. Well, they, the odds are, that, and it's a low pressure, but every once in a while they're going to strike a molecule. Right? If they strike a molecule with enough energy, has to be enough energy, it'll emit that light. Okay. So different and since in PCAM you start talking about quantization of energy, so it's spectroscopy because, man, different gases are, like nitrogen, is going to emit a whole different range of colors than oxygen will or hydrogen will or mercury. And it's a discontinuous light source, and the only way I can show that to you is if you actually looked at it. And that's what we would have done. We would have looked at it. We would have seen these lines. It's, it's not at all like a flashlight. So a discharge lamp is supposed to be discontinuous. Flashlight is supposed to be continuous. So if I want to show the continuity of the emission of a filament in a light bulb, which one of these would I use? A polarizer or a grating? All right, so I can spread out the white and see Roy G. Biv. Which one do I use again? Yeah, I want to see the colors from this flashlight. So I would use which one? A grating, right? And what's it's just the D, actually. That's the polarizer. Uh, what grating? D-I-F-F? -F? Diffraction. Diffraction grating. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's see what. I, have, I was having trouble with this last time. How I did it? Maybe it's the flashlight. It's just too. Oh man, you gotta be really close to see it. Yeah, I gotta get a different flashlight to use this. Can you see it right there? Ooh, let's try that one. You can kind of see it, right? 
So it, this is an LED, though, so it's not going to look as good as a, an actual filament. So that LED has all several different semiconductors in there, so it's emitting red and all the main, the main components, but it's not going to look as good as a filament. Maybe this is an LED. That's why it's not working so good. Anyway, okay, so let's take a look at our little animation here. Oh, I have it down there. I need that. So what we're going to do is here's hydro hydrogen is there's only one molecule of hydrogen in there, and what we're going to do is, oh, it doesn't show me the, the energies of the hydrogen atom. Oh, there it is. OK, so here's the energy of that little voltmeter. It's only 8 volts. See if I lower the voltage, the energy of that emitted electron goes down even lower. So here's the glass tube, right, filled with a very low pressure of, in this case, hydrogen gas. And here's the energy level. Here's the ground state of hydrogen. And then it has these excited states. It's like they only have six of them labeled, right? So I can fire as many electrons as I want here. Is it going to emit light? No, because I have to, right, because I got to get that energy of that electron has to be at least higher than the first excited state. So I can't drag that up, so instead I got to crank up the voltage until it gets up there. All right. And then turn on the, boy, let's get rid of these squiggles. That's confusing. See what's happening oh, down here? It's trying to show you the, what the, the wavelengths. So it's far UV is what hydrogen is getting rid of. How about uh, mercury? And it's a lot cooler to actually see these things, to see these lamps and see these colors. So if, with mercury, you would have seen, let's see if I can get some lines on there. You can kind of see the colors coming off. Okay, there's the lines. So you would have seen those lines for mercury in here. You would have seen those colors. We changed the lamp to something else like neon. Okay. Now notice how, look at the energy of the electron. It's not going to be high enough. I can, there's many electrons, it's not going to be high enough. So I need to, I don't think I, I can't even crank it up high enough for neon. That'd be kind of a waste. Sodium, ooh, look at that, I can get them all. See, I'm, the energy of the electron is higher than even the sixth one, so I should see all the lines. So a line is, do you recognize how a line's coming from? Yeah. It's going to, the electron's going to slam into this sodium atom, and it gets excited to one of these. So it can jump down from one state to the other, or it can jump all the way back down to the ground state, right? So the bigger the, the energy jump, right, the longer the wavelength or the shorter the wavelength, the bigger that energy jump. Bigger energy means higher frequency which is shorter wavelength. So you're going to see the blues for those big high energy jumps and the reds for short energy jumps. Okay. So you kind of see it better like this. All right. Let's see the spectrometer. So you can see the lines a lot better. Okay. But it's kind of actually, well, so just have to imagine, I guess. But this is what you would have seen. And it's kind of hard to see it, but it works. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's find that. That's right. Yeah, but I remembered looking at that. There wasn't much to see. We'll see it, though. View picture of actual discharge lamps. So this is what they look like. OK, that's what they look like. So you don't have to have it be a tube, a straight cylinder. You can have it be the, you know, something like this, so it lights up your signs, right? So this is 
wouldn't it be cool to have your name in lights, right? But look at all the work you'd have to do. You'd have to have these glass tubes and all this high voltage and all this stuff. Well, why not make an organic light emitting diode, Mel? And she gave up on this. It would have been so cool, right? We're going to make an organic. We're working on making an organic light emitting diode, and you'd just paint the material like Melissa, right? <laughs> and slap it between two electrodes, and it should glow the color of that organic light emitting diode. Somebody gave up. Yeah, that's, I know. I, I still think it should be doable. I don't see why it wouldn't be doable. And you can walk around with a little 9-volt battery in your pocket with a little hunk of glass, and you can have it say whatever you want. Wouldn't that be cool? And you'd be sealed in glass, perfectly safe. You're not gonna, no one's going to get sick unless they bust it and eat it or something. But. Jeez. Wine, wine, wine. And you could sell them, right? Well, maybe you could make it solar. If it's organic light emitting diode, maybe it doesn't need that much voltage. You can make it solar. <laughs> OK, so we had our light source. Now we have our what selector? Wavelength. Wavelength selector. So the one that we're going to worry about is a monochromator. So just have an idea how this works. Now, if you, when you were on the AA, you messed with something called slit widths. Remember that, Andy? Slit widths. Mm -hmm. Or not? Does anyone remember this? Yeah. And then you had to look in the AA cookbook, and it told you, oh, use this wavelength, and use these slit widths and stuff. OK. Here's a monochromator. Slit widths are in here somewhere. The way this is set up right now, Right? Here's your light source. This is probably a what? What would you call this? Well, not gradient, grading. Grading. There's your diffraction grading. Yeah. <laughs> so notice how it's, it's diffracting all the colors. OK, it's diffracting all the colors. And I can rotate it. That's what, the, that's what the monochromator does. Why does it rotate it? Because let's say right now, oh, what color is that? Dark green. Do I have a dark green? Here's a dark green. Here's a dark green. So the dark green is coming out. Now I just picked green. Okay. So this black line must be a what? A uh, Mirror, right. So it, in a monochromator, the mirrors don't move. You don't even want to mess with them. The only thing that's going to move is the grating, and it's all calibrated. So when the grating is at this position, it knows that it's kicking out green light. If it rotates, and then so I can get, with this? oh, we're not there yet. We're almost there. If you rotate it. Now I've got the orange light, right? Kind of. That's too light, but that's the idea. OK, so where's the slit widths in this stuff? Where's the slit, S-L-I-T, W-I-D-T-H-S's? Where are they? Is the gaps in between? Yes, there it is, the gaps. There's your slit widths. You have two of them. OK. Yeah. Now, you had some problems with the AA. It said that if your signal was, remember if the signal was way too high, what did you have to do? Yeah, did you make the slit width smaller or bigger? You made them smaller, right? So de you decrease the amount of light that's going through. So by making these slit widths smaller, right, you're going to have even less intensity coming through, even less intensity coming over here. Now what's kind of interesting, I think, is this slit width would have everything to do with intensity, correct? Because that's right in front of the light source. 
right? I think that's, it's going to have a big change there. But you mess with this slit width. I can't see. Oh, you can't see yellow. This one has a lot to do with intensity. Right? That one has a lot to do with intensity. This one has a lot to do with what? If you go back to that little di this diagram that we drew, what's actually coming out of the monochromator? Right? If you adjust that second slit width, it's going to adjust the width of the light coming out of there. Right? If you have a really wide slit width, you're going to have a wider range of wavelengths. Right? Because look, it's not just, it's not really working perfect here. I mean, let's say you've got orange and red. The way this is going, looks like you have orange and red. So right now I have my red color. So red's coming up and red's squeezing through. Orange might be squeezing through too. I don't know if you can see that one. Right? If that slit width is wide enough. But if you make it narrower, it's going to be even more specific for that one individual wavelength. Make sense? So that's the idea of a monochromator. And you can, you can, can control those slit widths. What did you say that second slit width measured? Or? I would say this one controls, oh, the technical word would be bandwidth. If, and what, that, what they mean when they say bandwidth, they're saying, go to the half, half height of this thing. Let's pick one peak. Go to the very half height and see how wide that is. How wide is it in nanometers? Full width, half max. FWHM, that's more information than you need. but. I would say that that second slit controls the full width half max. Now, actually, they, they both have a big effect on it, but that second one really does. Much more, much more so, I think, because it's after the grading. Let's see. Detector. OK, so we've got our wavelength selector. And then a detector. Here it is. A PMT, a photomultiplier tube. So what it is, it has to be something that's going to convert what to what? It's supposed to be right on the end here. Like you could have your eyeball. Well, that's not a good idea, right? So you're going to have a PMT instead. So this must convert what to what? Light to electric, electric signal. Yeah, some kind of electric signal, some kind of current or voltage, something that you can measure so that you can correlate the amount of light with the signal. So this is your signal, your electric signal. So you can make nice plots and those sorts of things. So this a photomultiplier tube is not a wavelength selector. It's going to, every single wavelength is going to it's going to detect. It can't tell. Okay. What, wa what wavelength are you at? Well, the computer has to be communicating with the wavelength selector so it knows what the signal is that's coming from the PMT, what, what, intense, what the intensity is at different wavelengths. Okay. So what does it look like? I would say something like you got this. Right? It's like we have this dome on top. I'll pass this around, but first I want to draw it. You got this kind of like dome thing on top. Okay. And all these little electrical connectors on the bottom. So it's, it looks kind of silvery, but I'm just going to make it green because I can't draw silver. There's this photo emissive material. And what that is is when light strikes it, 
it's just going to eject electrons. So it doesn't, the range of, there's going to be a range of wavelengths, pretty much a UV vis. All the way from the ultraviolet through the visible, this thing will kick out electrons as long as those wavelengths and those regions strike it. Radio waves strike it, nothing's going to happen, not enough energy. Okay. So you have this photoemissive material. And then they're going to have these, if you can look on the sides, there's these copper guys. Okay. And they're called dynodes. D-Y-N-O-D-E-S. And those dynodes are what's connected to these little electrical connectors on the bottom here because they're at varying voltage. What's the, ch electrons are negative or positive? Negative. negative. So these dynodes you want to be positive because you want the electrons to be attracted to it. So the first one might be around, I don't know, positive 20 volts. So light strikes the photoemissive material, kicks out some electrons, and they're attracted to that positive charge. And then what they did is they coated each dynode with more of that photoemissive material. So we might have, we should probably put some of that on each one of these. Okay. And our voltages, so the voltages are slowly going to get kicked up here. Positive 20 volts, positive 100, positive 200, 300. I'm just making numbers up. They just get more and more positive, okay? But since each dynode is coated with that photoemissive material, you might get a few electrons at first. This guy's really sensitive, just like your eyeball. <coughs> your eye is really, really sensitive. Oh, what color is electrons? Let's make them purple, right? So it kicks out some electron, but now you get a few more electrons. You get even more electrons, all right? See how this is getting to work? And then a ton of electrons. What they call, they call it a cascade of electrons is what's generated. So all from one electron, you get a cascade of electrons. Right? It's really sensitive. So this very last one, this is what's really detecting a very easily measurable current and because a lot of electrons are striking it, all from just a few. Okay? So it's glass, so don't don't drop it. Now, there's a problem with these photomultiplier tubes, though. And this is it. They call it dark current. And negative 20C, negative 30C, negative 40C, negative 50C, what's the C probably? Mm -mm. What they're trying to show is this is some, this is a, like photographic plate. And then all they did is they had the, the PMT, right? So instead of having a, a detector down here, they just put a photographic plate at the very bottom for the cascade of electrons. They put a, photo, a photographic plate. So these are, every little white dot you see was an electron that struck it. And it looks like negative 20C has a lot more dots than negative 50C. The C is probably what? degrees Celsius. They're making it colder and colder and colder. So, and this is when there's no, there's no, this is in a dark box. There's no light even striking this thing. So that's why they call it dark current because you shouldn't be getting any signal. There's no light. But realize this is just a material and you've got this high voltage there. Electrons are going to, just at room temp, electrons get kicked out of there. So you get all the way down to negative 20 and you still have signal, negative 30, 40, 50. So dark current's a bad thing. It looks like how could it be minimized according to what they're trying to say? Making it colder. 
making it cold. So we could have done that. We could have forked out an extra 15 grand for our UV Viz. And it would have had this big tower on top where you have to keep dumping in, what would you guess? Liquid nitrogen. You have to keep dumping in liquid nitrogen. Pain in the butt. Who wants to do that? What we have works good enough. So, but that's the idea. Get it in liquid nitrogen temps, and man, you're going to have no background at all. Okay. Ours still works because remember, if you want to get an absorbance measurement, you're really measuring two things. What were they again? Transmittance. Yeah, your absorbance is negative log of transmittance. Yeah. But that's negative log of what over what? P over PO, right? Or PO over P, one of the two. So you're measuring the incident and the transmitted. So if you have a dark current, the baseline's just kicked up. So it really kind of cancels out. Okay. Let's see. Now I've got a little picture here. What is this guy? Beer's Law. Or no, I have it already. Beer's Law. Okay. So this guy is going to show me. Turn on the little laser. The light's going to, or the light source, not laser. The light source is going to shine through here and it's going to strike this. Beer's Law is A equals EBC. Where's my little b? Path length. How do I adjust the path length in this thing? You see it? Move the little box. Yeah, and I'm really cranking up the path length. OK. So the c is going to be concentration, so that's this. The wavelength, OK, I can make it whatever color I want. What would you guess is going to be a color where I'm going to get some Let's put it on absorbance. I'm going to get a really high absorbance signal. What color would you guess? Would it be the same color as this stuff? Right. It's, it's hard for you to see this. This is actually supposed to be pink. Oh. It's easier to see it on, on the computer. I don't know if you can see it. Come over here. This will be easier. You only have a few minutes left. That pink is a bad color. I wonder if I could pick it a different look. Oh, there. Oh, you can't see purple either. Uh, all right. So it's pink. So you definitely, if you want it to absorb, it's definitely not going to be that pink color because it's scattering that pink color. It's not absorbing it, right? The color you want is, starts with a C, it's calm. Complementary color. What's the complementary color of red? Green. Green. So somewhere in here is going to be the highest absorbance. Look at that, 0.51. Can we get it any higher? Ooh, we guessed really good. All right? <laughs> so you get it to the red, it doesn't absorb at all. Okay. So make the path, width, path length be higher, this goes up. Absorbance goes up. Make the concentration higher, it goes up. So that's it. So we're out of time. Have a good day.